Hey, hey everybody, welcome on into ClayShare Live. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and this is our weekly live tutorial we bring to you all. I know last week there wasn't one, and everybody missed me. I missed you too. I took a week off after ClayShareCon. If you missed ClayShareCon, and it's possible you missed ClayShareCon, it was only four days of free online awesomeness, um, online pottery awesomeness, I should specify. You can go watch that on ClayShare.com or download the ClayShare app and you can watch all of the free content. And we did have a special evening program for our premium members where they got three private tutorials just for them. So my premium members get a little extra as they always do because they're our ClayShare family. And today we're going to do something really fun. We're going to use one of the companies that was part of ClayShareCon, Paula McCoy's Colors for Earth. We're gonna use her color concentrates tonight, and we're gonna do what's called flooding for texture. And you've seen me do something similar to this with watercolor pottery. So here is a beautiful vase that I did, and I definitely think we have to go to camera two for you all to see this because the lights and the mother of pearl reflection is just gonna be way too much. So we're gonna switch you on over so that you can see it close up. But this was done with the flooding. The difference being here is the line work was created by Mishima. So I hand carved the line work. And the same with the mug that I'm, I'm also going to show in just a second. So all the black line work was just freehand carved. And then I had a black outline after it was bisque fired. And then I did, there's the mug, the watercolor pottery on it, which is basically where you water down under glaze. You could use glaze, but under glazes work better. And you paint it on like watercolor. And then you put a glaze on top. I usually put a clear glaze, although you could put a solid on glaze on top if you want to. So we're taking that same idea of the watercolor pottery and we're gonna apply it to a highly textured surface. So something like uh, this plate right here, I'll put it up to camera too. Uh, and here's a mug, and the Peace and Love mug is the one I showed today um, for you all, and actually here. There's the Peace and Love mug, and I have a rainbow mug. So these are some of our mini rollers, but they give you this really nice raised texture. And when I designed these, you know, I can do them in reverse if I want to, and then the, where the lines are raised, they would be impressed, they'd be recessed, but I don't want that. I want these raised lines because specifically like on the rainbow. I can just color in each stripe of that rainbow a different color and that color is gonna stay in there because those lines are there. Same thing with the lettering and the daisies and the peace signs and the doves and everything I got going on. So it works really well on highly textured pieces like this, especially like this flower. That's gonna be amazing when we color it in because that raised area, that outline is gonna hold the color in for us. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. And then in prime time for my premium members, we are gonna do all about handles. We're gonna talk about ha different types of handles, show various ways of making handles and talk about where you place your handle on a specific form. And we'll get to that in prime time. So that's at 6.15 just for my premium members. So you guys will you get to see that in a little bit. That's gonna be fun. All right. so. I was showing this on Instagram a little earlier. This is a test plate I did. I have a class on making test plates. If you want to go make a test plate, go do that. Test plates are not anything new. They've been doing this forever, basically, in the ceramic industry. When I was in France and I went to the Sev factory um, back in 2015, you know, they had some from the 1750s. So no test plates are not a new thing, maybe new to you all that are just seeing them, but they've been doing them for hundreds of years. Should you do one? Absolutely. Test plates are great because you're testing out the color product, whether it's an underglaze or a glaze. You're also testing out the clay you're gonna be using them on, and if it's an underglaze, the glaze you're gonna put on top. So you get a lot of information. Plus, I got a bunch of these and they look so cool hanging on the walls in the studio. You know, so this one is stroke and coat, Mako stroke and coat with clear 2167 on top. This is speedball right here, uh, under glazes with 2167 clear on top. So I've got Mako, I've got Amico up there. I don't know, I don't think y'all can see the Amico. Well, you can, you can, you can say the Amico. I got another speedball because sometimes you need more than just the 24 spaces. 
but I actually have a class showing you how to make this exact plate and then another class showing you how to use this plate to make the test plate and you don't have to make them this big and you can make your stripes different ways everybody does it differently um, it's really a personal preference for for you but tonight we're using colors for earth so that's why I grabbed this little one out of my off the wall really okay so let's get going on this. I've got bisqueware, and this does work best on bisqueware. And that's because if you make a mistake and need to wipe off any overrunning or a color gets where you want it to not be, it's much easier to wipe it off on bisqueware than it is greenware. Because if this was leather hard greenware and I tried to wipe back, these edges would soften and I'd probably wipe some of them away. And I don't want to do that. So that's why we're doing it on bisqueware. Plus, bisqueware is very thirsty, and that's what we want. All right, this just came out of the bisque kiln, so I'm going to do what we always do when you first get fresh bisque, is I like to wipe it down with a damp, clean sponge to get rid of any dust or crumbs or clay bits that are left. Also, I want to check it over to see if there's any burrs or raised areas that are sharp, and if they are, I will go in with a damp sanding sponge. Usually I use a diamond core tool sanding sponge, or sanding pad, if you will. And I will use that to just wet sand it down and then wipe the area. And I, I've done that in all my glazing videos. I don't really want to take up our time doing that. All right, I got three things we're gonna try to get done tonight. We'll see if we can get them done. I've got a palette. I usually use a bigger palette, but for this tonight, I thought I would use this little guy because it's easy to get a hold of. They're about a dollar, I think, in most stores. Now, brush-wise, you want brushes that are going to be very thirsty and hold a lot of material and can come to a very fine point. A Sumi brush is perfect. Paula has these gorgeous Sumi brushes from Colors for Earth. Those would work great. You can also pick up these inexpensive. These were a teacher's pack I got from Dick Blick years ago. But um, any standard size Sumi, S-U-M-I, brush will work for this. And then whatever colors you want to put on the surface. I'm going to be using the Colors for Earth that Paula McCoy sells. And let's see, do I have any of her brochures from, these are her glass enamels because she does glass too. I don't think I have her brochure here. But the Colors for Earth color concentrates. The difference between these and underglazes is these do not have clays in them. They are just the pure concentrated color. So there's no clay. That's good. That means when you're applying them, they're brighter, they're more translucent, and they'll be more translucent when you're done. They won't be as chalky and they won't be as op opaque. They'll give you that beautiful translucent quality. And I've picked out a few colors, you know, I'm working on some pieces that have rainbows. We have bright things happening, so I want bright, juicy colors, so that's what I've chosen. Um, I'll actually read you off the colors if y'all want to know. But i got to put on my glasses so I can read it for you guys. And then, let's see, we'll start with red. I've got red geranium, and I can show you here, and maybe we'll go over to the camera too. Um, I'm going to just base it on this. You know, what happens when we do test tiles is sometimes colors don't turn out the way we hoped they were going to turn out, and that's fine. That's just part of the process. It's good to just have the information so we know. And I think I'll bring you all in a little closer. There we go. All right, so red geranium. This is what it looks like fired to cone five, about cone six. So I know that that's going to give me a beautiful red. The orange I picked, Florida orange, that's the orange that I have right here. This is curry. It's, a, it's another orange color, so if you like that orange, you could go with that. The yellow's not on here, uh, not on this test tile. It's called Sunflowers, but I have used it. It's the yellow I used the center, in the center of this beautiful piece. So I know what that color looks like just from trying it out. You know, that's risky sometimes. And then the green, I have some choices. I can go with green leaf or I can do laurel leaf. I want the brighter, so I'm going to go with green leaf right here. For my blue, this cerulean, it's, it's beautiful. It's very similar to my Himalayan blue poppy, don't you think? I think a layered piece with texture, if you're going to stain with the cerulean, and then Himalayan blue poppy could be amazing. You get this deeper blue depth to it, if you want to try that. And then uh, bright violet for the purple. 
and that's that there. Now I will tell you deep cranberry burned away at cone five, cone six, but at low fire temperatures, your deep cranberry is gonna stay. So if you're a low fire, if you're, and remember, if you're low fire, this is totally different. Your colors will probably be brighter and they won't burn out like some of mine do at cone five and cone six. All right, so once you've got your colors picked out, and this is a good thing to keep next to you on your work surface too. So you have it right here and you can refer to it. And then I'm just gonna take my colors and shake them up because they do settle. The pattern on my mug, a stamp. The, this mug, the carved mug, are we, this is hand carved Mishima that I carved into the clay freehand, if you're talking about this one. The piece that we're doing tonight, the Peace and Love, is our mini roller, Peace and Love. That's this guy right here. And the rainbow is the rainbow roller right here, which has the happy flowers. Very, very um, 70s vibe going on in the studio lately. So if those were what you were asking about, I hope I covered it. Okay, I shook up the red geranium and I'm just gonna put four or five drops in and I'm just gonna go around and put the colors in and I'm gonna space them out every other so that I have room to water some down or mix them because you can mix. I'm gonna run out of room though, I think on my palette. Two of them gonna have to be next to each other. Nope, three, sorry, doesn't matter. <laughs> Christina says, Michael Harbridge has you covered for the br any brush, I love it. Yeah, Michael had an amazing set of brushes for sale, 40% off or something during Clay Share Con? Crazy good prices. I was like shocked. I have, if you could see the brushes I have, I'm, I'm brush poor, we would say. All right, I'm gonna put a little water in a mug just to have some water on hand for thinning things down. I've got a paper towel ready to dab things if they get a little carried away. I don't know where a green string came from, but that was in the studio. This is a lint-free shop towel. These are really great. You can buy them from Uline on the roll. And I've had the same roll for, I'm going into my third year. So yeah, they're expensive to buy a giant roll of them, but they last forever and they're lint free. All right, let's start with the flat piece because when we're flooding things, we're gonna be putting a lot of liquid on the surface and we want them to go, it to go in a certain area. And on a flat surface, it's easier to work with. So if you're just trying this out for the first time, you might wanna do it on a tile or a flat plate like this. Mugs we're gonna do, but remember we have curves that are introduced. So that makes a whole nother level of trickery happen. Okay, take your brush and I do have a bigger bucket for swishing out here too. Could you use the same process with my celadons? You can, but I'll tell you what happens when we use glazes. Um, glazes usually go on thicker, so you need more volume, more product to get a good color payoff. With these, you don't need as much. So that's kind of why um, I like to do it with underglaze, but absolutely, and I've done it with other celadons in the past. So, and if you want, we'll, we can do a comparison. I'll do it on another broadcast, or just on my own, I'll do some with the celadons for flooding. Now, these are gonna be watery, like watercolor, and go on like watercolor. The glazes are gonna be thicker, right? They have other materials in them, so they've, they've got a thickness to them. I actually have a little teeny tiny bottle I usually use, but I don't know where I put it full of water. We're just gonna go with this. All right, so you get your color. How's that? You guys can see, do we need to zoom in closer? Can you come in closer? The clay that all the things you're seeing here right now was made with is B-Mix, Laguna B-Mix 5. And my test plate was done with B-Mix 5 because that's what I use mostly in the studio, although sometimes I will do it on a porcelain because I use that a lot as well. All right, so I'm just gonna take off any excess. You see how I got that to a point? And I'm gonna go in, you pick which way your rainbow goes. Do you want the red on the outside or do you want the red on the inside? It really is up to you. We're just gonna apply that 
and let that sit in there. So you're really flooding the area with your color. Just, you have to watch out, you don't put too much in. Now another option for application, and I have done it this way before, is to use little bottles. You can get them, they're uh, quilting glue bottles, I think, is where I find them, but they have the teeniest tiny little tips. And they are amazing for this because you fill each bottle up with a color and then you just basically draw with that tip. See how that went down there? Do you see how that just filled itself in so easily? So the red for the rainbow is done. But if you want, you know, you're going to do other things red, right? It's not just going to be the rainbow. So you can pick now or you can do all the rainbow. Some people like to work one color across the entire surface. Other people like to go back and forth and just do one section. You'll, you'll figure it out. I'm a one color at a time girl. I like to try to do all my colors at once. That way I don't end up putting, how should I say, putting, if I do all the reds, I can space them out, right? But if I do one red and then I do a blue, green, and I get caught up and I realize I didn't do another red and then I have to put two reds too close to each other, does that make sense to folks? So I'm just going to scooch over. And this raised texture is going to hold that really nicely. We're going to do a red down here. See how it holds the colors in there? I need to come up a little bit. Where else do we want a red? Mm, it's the edge, but it needs color too, right? We'll do this as red as well. Now we're on a bit of a slant, so you got to think about maybe you want to rock it to keep it from flowing over or just do less and do two layers of it. You can go back and do a second layer if you feel like it's too watery, and it could be. It could end up being a little watery. All right, I'm holding this on an angle just a bit so that I can get in here. I'm going to see if I can find one of those, those bottles for you all to see quickly. So I filled this to the tippy top. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but because I did that, we've got to con be concerned about it overflowing. So either go to wait and hold it for a long time or take, and this is what I often do, is keep another brush. I just got it damp just so I can shape it. Keep another brush nearby and you can go in and suck out some of the excess with that brush. So that way you don't get any running. And you just keep that one nearby to use. Let's see if I have any of those. Well, it kind of like this one. This one isn't right though. This is too big of a tip. That's too fat. That one there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste our time looking for it. When I find it, I'll, I'll share it on. Yeah, I don't know where they are. I had a whole bunch of them. I'll find them and I'll share them with you all. So this is a, a bit of a time consuming thing, but as many of you know in pottery, there's a lot of things that take take time. They take our time. There's no fast answer for anything. You know, when I was a younger potter, I was always looking for ways to make pottery, make more pottery faster, right? And that's not, that's not uncommon. We want to make more and we want to make it faster, especially when you're trying to make a living at it. But it seemed all the little shortcuts I was trying to find actually took longer. And it ended up being, I went back to the way I'd been doing it to begin with. All right, so I got the reds in there, and I think I'm going to do one more red. We'll do this one red up here, and then we'll move on to the next color. Now, this rainbow is one, two, three, four, five. It's not six. I didn't do a six-striped rainbow. I know rainbow purists out there are just not able to cope with that, but I'm going to tell you, six did not work. It was too many. It didn't fit, so we have a five stripe rainbow. So you'll just have to pick which color you don't put in the rainbow. I think for me it's gonna be green. So, but you pick on yours. So they are, under glazes are diluted, yes. I am cutting them at least in half because they're highly concentrated. So if we went like this, I don't know if you can see on the pad, do you see how thick that is? That would be really hard to apply. So we need to thin it down. 
And to do that, you can either take a bottle of water, you can dip your brush in some water and bring it over into your palette. Just put a little water in there. So that's about half what we started with, but these are highly concentrated. I'm only going to be doing one coat of it. So let's go in and do the orange now. And if you put a coat on and you are looking at it and you're thinking it's just not thick enough, that's okay. Do a second coat. The beautiful thing about underglazes, any underglaze, is you can layer them on top of each other. You could do a different color on another color if you wanted to. Right? So if you did a yellow and you wanted some green, you could put a green on top. Just keep in mind that darker colors will hide some of the lighter colors. So we got orange there in the center, well in the second row, and then let's put orange and flowers. Here's a flower. So this is the kind of thing that would take a little while, right? You're going to do this not when you need to make a hundred plates for tomorrow. That would be very stressful, trying to meet that deadline. So do you see how it works? Pretty easy. Quilting bottles may or may not be more expensive. Amazon has bottles with different size tips. All in a set, you bought some so they might, must have been less expensive. I found them, oh, let me think for a minute and see if I can remember the name of the company that I got it from. I can see them in my head. <laughs> like I can see the bottle, but I can't see the, the name. I'll remember it, and when I do, I'll tell you all about it. All right, we're going to do this in the orange. So I don't think with the time we have tonight we'll finish all of these on air, but I want to get a couple done. So I'm going to move on to the yellow now because there's just no way I'm going to be able to do it all. I definitely want to do one of the mugs for you. At least get into one of the mugs. Might not get it done, but get it started. Rainbows are red on the outermost ring and go to the other colors ending in purple. Well, I did it correctly then, didn't I? So I get points for that even if there's only six, five of the six. Although the center could be one, right? You could make that purple. So that theoretically, we've got six areas we could fill. Just saying. Maybe we'll do that. It'll be like the choose your own ending book. Choose whether you color in the center of your rainbow. Now I did one. I don't think I grabbed it. Let me see where I put it. Over here. Let me show you. Where I didn't flood. Um, and it's the peace and love. But I want to show you. You're going to be able to tell once we finish the color on this, but here's one I did where I didn't flood. I did black underglaze, wiped the black back, and then just brushed on yellow, the buttercup, and then lily of the valley. And this is on Tucker's mid smooth stone speck. So you see it's a speckled clay. And I brushed on uh, fairly thin coats. I didn't go really thick with the colors. I wanted more watery, but if you um, didn't water them down as much as I did, you could have punchier colors. I think I'm going to grab my seat since this is very close to me. Am I going to squeeze Roy, B, give Roy G. Biv into the arch? I'm going to try. We're going to try to squeeze it in. We'll see what happens. All right, so the smiley face has to be yellow. I just can't. I mean, you can make your smiley faces anything you want. Mine are yellow. And then there's the smiley faces in the center of the flowers. Do you make those yellow? Yeah, you do. And if you get color where you don't want it, you can just take a sponge or a Q-tip and wipe it off. So any raised area that you accidentally get color on, you can go back in and you can take it off later. So don't worry about that being a big issue. Because it's a raised area, it's easy to take that color off. 
Gosh, this is going to be so cute. So there's all the yellow. Mm, I'm going to put yellow in here too. But I say I wasn't going to do all of the colors I was going to skip through to try to get it done, and here I am doing them all, but you know. All right, I'll back off the yellow. Move to another color. So you have the little bottles with the tips and you're having a hard time, watered down, under glaze refuses to come out and then starts coming out the cap. So sometimes you can have an air bubble in there. So when you, I don't have any bottles to show. Um, this is a designer liner, so it won't work quite right. We'll do a bottle thing and I have done some bottles in the past, but what happens is you'll sometimes get material caught up in there. Under glazes are really gritty and grainy because they have clay in them. The color concentrates are not, they don't have clay in them. So those would probably work better for you. Also, if you get like air bubbles, you can get the little burping that happens and it splurts out and you get little bits of color where you didn't want it, which is very disappointing. When you're working on a big piece and you know, you're down to the end and then you accidentally send color flying. So this will work on any texture with raised edges. The same thing can be done uh, with Mish like Mishima that I do. The only thing with the Mishima is that you don't have a raised line to stop your color. You have a recessed line and it will stop your color to a point. So you'll have to not put as much on as we can here because we can really flood it. I'm filling these up, these little areas. You, can you tell how much I'm putting in there. They stay shiny for a long time, so we have to wait for them to all dry. Let's do this one up here too. And that one. That one's very full. All right, we'll let that sit for a second, and then we'll move to the cerulean here. And I think, you know, you could use Paula's Colors for Earth and put a tip on it and squirt it on, but I think the concentrates would be too concentrated for this technique. I, I think it would be more color than you want. But, but the thing is, you would just have, instead of a more watercolory effect, you'd have stronger, richer colors. That's really all I think you would have. The 70s design. I know. It's groovy, baby. So there's the blue. Look at it. It's looking so cute. We'll do blue in this one. Or do you do another rainbow? <gasps> See, that's the thing. You could. You could do other colors. It's kind of like doing stained glass in a way. Um, you're filling each area up with color. The look of stained glass, is, it's not at all like actual doing stained glass. I'm sorry if they're stained glass artists. I'm not trying to dismiss stained glass at all. <laughs> I'm, no, not at all. But it's the idea, right, is that you have a raised area and then your color in certain um, sections. All right, let's, I got to let that dry. I put so much in this big flower. but I really wanted it to be rich. Lots of color in there. Look at that flower. He's so happy. He's my favorite. I went to an exhibit ages ago and there was an artist um, and he's known, he's a Japanese artist, for his sunflowers. And this is based on his sunflowers. They don't look like his sunflowers, but um, they all have faces in them and they're just happy and they make me happy so I thought let's put those in mm -hmm. actually this one over here is more like the ones he does that I'm coloring right now with the open mouth and someone out there will know his name and they can let me know so I can remember because I'm terrible at names 
If it's not written down and in front of me, I just won't remember. Just terrible. Let's do this flower up here. So this is a very relaxing thing to do when you don't have a lot of time constraints. You could do it if you were um, going to take your pieces in the house and you wanted to work like in your living room or dining room in the evening. You know, if you like to do that, sometimes I'll take pieces when I'm doing decals in the house and I'll spend the evening doing the decal work. So I technically am still working after work day has ended, but it doesn't feel like work because I'm in the house. So that's how I tell myself it's not work. Right? Convince myself that, you're, oh, you're not really working. <laughs> Look at that. So the colors are coming along swimmingly. I'm gonna put some in there too. What's everybody thinking? Do they move in the firing, the color concentrates? They do not. They have no flux in them, which flux is the material and glaze that causes it to melt and run. And there's different fluxes, not just it's not just the material you buy. It's there's different materials. And we did talk about glazes and what makes up a glaze in a, a class a while ago. So if you're interested in that, search up glazes. We have a whole, whole band of glaze classes um, on Clayshire. But yeah, they won't move in if you, as long as the glaze you use doesn't move. If you use a glaze that's very fluid, um, then it might move. I'm going to use the 2167 clear which is my go-to. So I know that that won't move. It's going to stay put. This is, if you like coloring, this is for you. Because you get the rolling pins and you roll your texture in, you make your plates, you make your mugs, then you go ahead and bisque fire and then you do this and it's very soothing it's very calming I think that's one reason why I love doing these type of techniques I don't feel pressured to rush I'm not in a hurry look there's more rainbow over here folks but I feel would that take away from that rainbow hmm decisions decisions I'm gonna put purple down here Some purple up here, put purple here. So now I have to go back in and decide what colors I didn't put enough in, like I, I was skimpy on. And I think the, the orange sort of got shortchanged because I wasn't going to do all the colors and I stopped, but then I realized it's not fair. So we need some orange, so let's put orange in here. And on a plate like this, if you start with your uphill on the slope of the rim, you're going to make sure you get enough color on the upper side before it flows down to the lower areas. Sometimes those upper areas, like up here, won't get as much color because you start at the bottom and that's really where it's all absorbed into the clay. So start a little higher. What do we want this to be? That's going to be green. The center of that could be orange. And you can go outside, the, I'm using six colors to have a limited palette to make it easier on myself, but you can go outside of that. Um, you know, companies have 30, 40, 60 colors. There's a lot of color options out there. So if you want more colors on here, then do it. Don't, don't limit yourself at all. I'll put yellow in here too. All right, so I think I've got a few areas I might go back in and put some other colors in, but most of it's done. Let me turn around. Look at that, isn't that happy? So I can see some areas I gotta go back, I still gotta put color in. But a clear glaze on top, and you decide, do you do colors on the top and bottom or do you do clear? I'm probably gonna do just a glaze. I'm gonna brush clear in the center 
and I'm going to do on the rim on each side. I'm going to do the, mm, I think it's going to be Lily of the Valley green. It's this green that keeps coming back for me. That green there. Uh, but I'm not sure. I have to decide. I think the so two, it, yeah, you could have grass and sky. You could completely if you wanted to. So could you, if you watered down celadons and used them, would you put a clear on top? I would because a watered down celadon is definitely not going to give the um, super gloss finish that it would be unwatered down. So yeah, I would go ahead and put a clear on top. As long as it's a zinc free clear, you shouldn't have any problems. None of the mycelodons have zinc in it, so they won't react with things, which is nice. I'm putting red in the center of the smileys, that of the open mouths. And then, let's see, I thought I saw one more flower. I got some centers to do. And then let's go to the mug, so we can work on the mug for a few minutes before we're out of time. Oh, this one needs color. I'll get that one later. Would you over flood on purpose and show you how to clean up? Okay, yeah, we'll do it on this mug that accidentally got. So this is one of the mugs that fired that I, um, sorry, that froze and I fired it. It has, I don't think the camera can pick it up. Maybe it can. Do you see that crack down the center? So when clay freezes before it's fully dry, the liquid in it freezes and you get ice particles which splinter and split your clay apart. So that's what happened to this mug. So I bisque fired it and it hasn't opened up anymore, but in the glaze fire it could. It also has split, and I don't know if the camera will pick it up on the handle, there's little micro splits here. And I fired it to see one what would happen. I am going to glaze it and fire it. I'm not going to do this technique on it because it most likely is going to break and I don't want to put this much time into something that's going to break. I got another one too, but I am going to just simple glaze. I think I'm just going to stain it and do one color. Um, so if you're flooding an area and, and this is the thing about it, folks, if you put too much on and you realize it right away. So here we go. Oh, I got too much. Look way too much. See how it's overflowing. You want to go in as soon as you can with that damp, brush next to it and pull it back in the area then and I got q-tips you go in with a sponge and you wipe out you just kind of scrub it out and that takes care of it see and do you see how I brought it back now it's still going to dry if you have a tiny area I'm going to grab my q-tips I think are they under this side they're there so if you have and it's not a bad idea Instagram folks get to see me rummaging under the cabinet here. <laughs> All right, so you've got a little Q-tip and some clean water. You can go in, and if it's just a little area, you can scrub it out with the Q-tip. And that's how I'd fix it. If you're using a deep, dark color, like a dark blue or red or black, and you do that and it goes kind of crazy, you might have to take it into the sink and scrub it completely clean and start fresh and let it dry. And I know that's terrible because you put so much work into it. But if it happens, um, you know, I'm just going to scrub this out all the way because I'm just going to clear glaze this. But if it happens, you, you know, you save your piece and you start over. So try to not, um, try not to overdo it, right? All right, so we have this mug. And it's the same thing. We've got lettering on it. We've got peace and love. So I think we'll do uh, the colors. We could do each letter a different color. And if I'm going to get a whole bunch of colors involved and I'm going to go back and forth a lot, I have a whole bunch of brushes. I'm just going to get them all damp. And then I'll just use one in each color so that I don't have to keep swishing my brush out. I can just switch and pick up a different brush. So that's if you're going to do multiple colors at the same time. Put that one there. Put this one in here. Yellow would look nice. Linda, you're right. Maybe we should do yellow. That seems very 70s on it, right? Okay, let's do uh, rainbow peace and love. Who 
I'm going to go in with the red and just in the P here. The key really is to have a brush that can come to a very, very fine point. And brushes like these Sumi brushes, and you can get them in smaller sizes. You can get them at craft stores. I know Paula has some fabulous Kolinsky Sable ones that are amazing that she sells through Colors for Earth. So I can just switch out without swishing. Well, Diana, I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> they did this on the Great Pottery Throwdown. I haven't seen it yet. You know, it doesn't air in the U.S. And I do have expat, but I don't watch it till the following Saturday. I've, I'm sad because I didn't watch the Sculpture Animal Week, and now I can't watch it until it comes to the U.S. on the Great Pottery Throwdown because you don't get... Um, it doesn't keep them for longer than a week, apparently, on mine. So if I don't watch it, it goes away. And I was sad. I wanted to see them sculpt their animals, but anyhow. Great Pottery Throwdown in the UK is a great show. I love it. It'll be airing in the US, usually on HBO Max, I believe, is where it airs. And that's usually in April. So everybody will be able to watch it there. Um, there is this channel called expatprime.com that you subscribe to and you can watch it. All kinds of British shows there. So if you want to catch the Great Pottery Throwdown, the downside though is Expat Prime. You, it doesn't keep it more than a week, at least on mine it doesn't. So you got to watch them and you don't you can't really, I haven't figured out how to save anything, so it's, if you like British TV here in the U.S., it's worth it for, for you then. Okay, so we're almost done. Yeah, I have had been having a very 70s vibe happening in my life lately. Um, so I've been doing a lot of 70s inspired design. And you can just do that, right? If you didn't want, there we go. If you didn't want to do the rest colored, you could just do that. But I think, I think it should get. You love the great pottery throwdown. And Christine, the next time she's going to see a live, she's going to be in the U.S. Oh, I'm so excited for you coming. I'm not going to see you this trip. I'm sad about that. Um, I'm going to put red in all the way around right here. It's just going to follow the little line. If you wanted to stain this first with a black underglaze, you could do that and, and then go in and only add color to certain areas if you didn't think you wanted to add color to everything. Because you might not want to. And it is time consuming when you do one color that you brush on the entire thing and then wipe back. So now we've got peace and love there. And then I'll go in with, I think we'll do, we'll do orange. It was either going to be orange or yellow. wasn't sure. So you have BritBox and Acorn. My mom has Acorn. I've had BritBox. I get it from time to time because I'll watch a whole bunch of shows and then I'll be caught up and then I unsubscribe and then subscribe again. Huge Doctor Who fan here. Um, but I think a lot of us are, aren't we?
So when your lines are really tight and close together, you might get some on the top, right here on the raised. So all we'll do is I'll go back in after the color's dried with a Q-tip and just rub that on the edge, right on the top rim, and that'll get rid of any color left and just bring back the color of the clay. Now this technique, ideally you want to do it on a lighter colored clay body, although if you do tests, you might find dark clay bodies that work great with this, but again, you have to test to see. All right, so all the hearts have to be red, so I'll have to go around and find the hearts and make them red. There's the inner of a flower, flower, there's a smiley face, got to make him yellow. Are you zoomed in enough? Can you guys see? Closer is always better in my book, I feel. We've got a dove, a peace dove. To make him white, I mean, Paula does have a white. So we can put white in there. Let's get the white. <laughs> Glacier white. Don't get it near any other color or you'll tint it, right? Because... I need to get my brush wet so we can get that fluid enough. And then, how many doves do I have on here? There. So the dove's white. Let me pull it up really close. See that white there that's just drying? I wish you could be this close while I was painting it on. And then past seasons of The Great Pottery Throwdown are on HBO Max. Good. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, The Great Pottery Throwdown is a great show. It really is. Um, amazing, amazing talent on that show. I'm so impressed watching everybody and the things they make on there and their creativity. It's a good show to watch if you want to test your skills, right? Because you could take the assignments that they're given and try them yourselves and see how you do at it. You know, it'd be challenges for you. And there's a lot of, as we were mentioning, past seasons. So you can watch them and get inspired from that. So I made the heart rainbow. So I think I should finish the plate so I can at least glaze it for you all. Because we're not going to be able to finish the mug. You can see the time that we need. We don't have enough. So let's finish the plate. Let me just grab the plate. This would be yellow. And do the last few areas in this. And then I'll grab my glazes and we'll brush glaze on. And a little plate like this, you know, I could put in my little test kiln, little baby kiln, the one we gave away during Clay Share Con. Well, not the one we gave away because the mine is still here. The one we gave away is going to be shipped in March, end of March, I think, to its new owner. And that lucky person is going to get the new controllers. Um, do I want green in here? Sure. So I got a few areas. Yellow to fill in the center. There's stars. You can make your stars yellow if you want. Just checking, checking, checking. There's, oh. There's a whole flower that doesn't have color. That would be sad. Okay, I think I got everything on here. All right, so I do have a few areas. I'm just gonna take a Q-tip, get it wet, and then squeeze off the excess. I got a few areas where my color went where I didn't want it to, so I'm just going to wipe it back with the Q-tip. 
And then let's, let's glaze it. I'm going to grab my glazes. Hold on. So we're going to do clear. Now my clear, um, I got a big bucket of it, but I'll just scoop out a little bit because you all don't want to listen to me whiz that up. I'll just, okay, I scooped out a lot, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> I got a five gallon bucket of clear. So we just scooped some of that out. And now let me get my, what did we decide? Buttercup, right? We're going to do yellow. I let you guys choose. So I've got the yellow. And these are dip and pour glazes, but of course you can always apply them by brushing. All right, get my hand cleaned off. Now, I'm gonna do the clear in the center first because that is gonna be the area we wanna protect. I don't wanna get any color on it. So I'm just gonna take the clear that I have over here. Let me just take these. This is how I clean my brushes. See my water over here? You just put them in there and I'll swish them out after. Um, and then reshape the tips and let them dry. If they have the little string on them, you want to hang them, but they don't all have that. So let those sit for just a second. Don't let them sit too long. If they do, what can happen is the glue that holds the bristles and the ferrules will just come right out. All right, stirring up my clear. This is Clear 2167. It was a glaze that Val Cushing came up with, and I've been using it for ages. Um, Val Cushing was an amazing potter. He's also a veteran. He is now passed, sadly. Um, but I had the pleasure to know Val and learn from him and be inspired from him. So I use the Clear 2167. A lot of people think it's my glaze because I'll be like, my Clear. I don't mean it mine as in I own this clear glaze. I mean it as the clear glaze I'm using. So I never mean to misrepresent ever. But the clear that I use is Val's recipe. And he, um, you know, was fine with me using it when he was alive, but I never said it was mine. So I just want to be clear about that. Because a thing came up like a week or so ago about people had said it was mine and someone said, that's not hers. It's, it's not, I didn't invent that one, no. <laughs> I do use it a lot though. So I'm just gonna wipe my line back for my edge. And I just did one, kind of flooded it with the clear, right? And then the edge here, well, that'll be your choice. I'm gonna wipe it clean and I'll put the yellow on the edge. But if you wanted to just have clear on the edge, you could totally do that. It's so much more fun to watch me do the intricate little areas than you doing it. You think so? <laughs> Bring me all your intricate pottery and I'll glaze it for you. I'm kidding. <laughs> all right, that's our clear. Now we're gonna move on to the yellow and I've just got this little, these are fan brushes from Mako. Um, this is the number four. And that one there was the number eight, I think is what I used. Oh, the more people who watch the Great Pottery Throwdown on HBO Max, the more chance we get of getting it. I would love, I have talked with other people in the ceramic industry about producing our own version of it, of the Great Pottery Throwdown. I cannot, I do not have time. Um, that I'm gonna have to leave to somebody else. All right, let's put some of this on the back because we want to glaze the back. I'm just gonna brush on. And you could do one coat and then go right back over it because it is sucked into the clay so quickly. These, this will not, this celadon will not run much. It's very stable is nice. Let me clean up my little edge. It's almost dry. See how fast that dries? It's great. All right, so now we have the part where we got to pay attention, right? Because we're going to glaze along a line right there. And I probably will put on two coats. My buttercup is a little thin, I noticed, 
when I was doing test tiles yesterday with it that it was a bit thin. But two coats goes very fast. I do want to make sure I get right up to that clear. We don't want bare areas. Right now we're going to put another coat on. Light, light hand is sometimes better. And then make sure I have the edge. And it's done. If you think you might have areas that you didn't get enough glaze on, you can always take your clear and you can put the clear over. I'm going to put some right there. I just want to make sure I got that edge and it'll be fine. All right, so it's glazed and it's ready to go. There it is. We'll put this in the kiln. Um, I've got some other pieces. I've, I'm going to work on that mug probably some more tomorrow. And I'll get that so that we can use it. Do I whiz my dipping glazes each time I use them for dipping? Um, when I dip them, yes, I do, Nancy. Yeah. For brushing, you saw what I did, the um, buttercup right here. So when I use it, what I'll do before I put it away is I'll just wipe my rim. For the brush, this is just them poured into a mason jar. And as they are dippable, I don't really thin them down for the brushable version. And then I put the top on. But for these guys here, before I go to use them, uh, if I'm just going to brush it, do a little shaky shaky and that's it. All right. I was sitting down on the job. <laughs> the name of the app I watch it on, it's Expat Prime. Oh, Kevin did that for you. Thank you. No spoilers. No, no. I have no spoilers at all for you guys. I have been watching it. I've been loving it. I will never share spoilers for that until it's aired completely in the U.S. So um, I would never do that. So there we have this. We did all the color for it. It looked beautiful. It looked Looked, where did I put the one we're working? Where's the piece one gone? How did I lose my mug? Oh, there it is. So all that time to get that side. But look, there's a whole nother side to do. No! So the mug's going to take a little longer to get done. Um, but it's going to be so great when it's finished. And then I do have a rainbow mug to do. So I'm going to try to get these two done uh, tomorrow and then get these in the kiln. So I'll have these to share with you uh, by the weekend. And those of you who are late coming in, the colors I used are the Colors for Earth Color Concentrates. I do love them. They are fabulous. Uh, this woman, Paula McCoy, it's her company, and she's amazing. If you want to learn how to do fabulous surface decoration and brush strokes, she's the master. You need to check her out. She joined us for three Clay Share Con classes. One was just for premium members, but the other two are available for you all. She also has her own Facebook page where she does lives 7 o'clock central time on Tuesdays. I hope that's still correct for her. Um, but she has a blog post on colorsforearth.com. You can check Paula's stuff out there and um, see how ma amazing she is, as were all the folks that joined us this year for Clay Share Con. All right, so this week, Clay Share News, we have a new wheel throwing class coming out. It's a wheel thrown urn, but this class is not just for wheel throwers. It's for everybody out there because in it we talk about urn math. So you know how big you make your urns. That's very important. That applies to hand-built urns as well as wheel thrown urns. Doesn't matter how you're making your urn. You need to have it the proper size. We also do a glazing technique where we apply a glaze that we want to protect. So we put wax over it and then we glaze again with another color. We put decals on it and fire them on. And we also talk about the epitaph and how you know the correct etiquette for the order of the, the wording you put on there, like what people say on the urn. And this could be something you can guide your customers and clients through the process that have never bought an urn before. It's nice if you know exactly how the urns should be what they should say. I mean, a customer can have anything they want on an urn, but there is a standard um, etiquette for it, and I teach that in that class as well. So it's a pretty big class. Kev, how long is it? You edited it. I didn't edit it. It took me like a week to film. So he did the editing. And well over, it's over an hour. 
yeah, it's well over an hour. It's a, it's, a, it's a hefty class, but it's a good one. And it's one that I think if you've ever thought about making urns or making anything that's personalized because we do that with the decals, this would be a good class for you. So check that out. That's going to be out Friday. All of my premium members are going to get that. It's only a premium class, so if you haven't signed up for ClayShare yet, you can do a seven-day free trial. And after that... Oh, it's it, right at two hours. Long. Oh, it's at two hours long. Okay, I'm hour sorry. Hour and 51 minutes, but it's, you know, it's a lot of information, very valuable information. I think y'all are going to love it. I sadly can't show you the urn that I made for the class because it has already been given to the client. So, but I show you in the class. <laughs> I just don't have it here right now. I can't do anything about that. All right. Um, poor Instagram. I left them just hanging over here. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So it happens when I have too many um, things happening at once. All right. So we are done with Clayshire Live. We're over time tonight. We will be back not next week, but the week after. Next week I'm going to be visiting our neighbors in the north, the great white north, um, for a little, little Canada time. And then I'll be back the week after, and we'll have our regularly scheduled program. So I'll see you all then. Premium members, I'll see you in about 10 minutes. Bye, everyone.